where your buyer or your seller has a little tiny flame burning, and you have the opportunity to pour something on it, you choose what you're going to pour on it. And as a person in my life who has occasionally poured gasoline, I can assure you that water is a better choice. So today, if you have a tiny little flame burning, and someone else in the room has an opposite tiny little flame burning, somebody in here needs to pour water on that. Y'all get that truth out? It's another version of you act bad, you're leaving. Okay, the goal for this meeting is to enhance communication and encourage positive dialogue. All constructive suggestions and comments are welcome, although matters may not be immediately responded to. This meeting is intended to be an open forum. The following rules of order will be enforced to promote civility and ensure that anyone who wishes to be heard has that opportunity. So we know that over the last few weeks, questions and concerns and topics from the membership have been compiled and sent in through social media. And we will begin the meeting by a compilation of me asking the board those questions and them giving answers to you. And meanwhile, you'll be able to go anywhere around this room and write questions on these whiteboards close to you if you choose to do that. And those might be mentioned today and they might be answered later. As well as we have an opportunity for people to send in Facebook questions, which they're going to bring me after these prepared questions get done. And then, a little later on, we will have the opportunity for you to line up with the mic and uh, ask questions. Our real request is, and, and my personal request is, that you not repeat each other. So if one person asks the question that you wanted to ask, in a little different way, let's don't repeat it. I'm probably going to do my best to remember what questions were asked to keep that from happening. I'm sure somebody up here will remind me if I missed that. It will save time and trouble. And I will recognize each speaker and grant that person the opportunity to speak. So when it's time for that, you'll line up at the mic that doesn't work as well as this one. and. Uh, we would ask you to respect each other and not to try to talk over somebody speaking who has the floor. And again, I will give you one warning if you're acting bad, outburst, interruption, any of those other things. And a second time, I'm going to call Richard. My buddy Richard in the back of the room with shirt says security. And he's going to walk you out of the room. And I don't even need anybody to think I won't do that. Because I will so, we're going to begin by introducing your board of directors, and we're going to start right here with Brandy, and you're going to hand the mic down. Tell them who you are. Paul. Paul. Oh, there we go. Hi, Brandy Guthrie. I am the president of the Austin Board of Realtors this year. I'm Aaron Farmer. I'm the immediate past president for the Austin Board of Realtors. I'm uh, Romeo Manzanilla, uh, board. This is my third year on the board. I'm Bill Morris. This is also my third year on the uh, April board. I'm TAR director, long time uh, <coughs> member of the legislative management team, past chair, current chair of the policy team working on code next, and a member of the uh, budget and uh, bylaws committees. My name is Jason Peoples. I'm this year's secretary treasurer and I'm also a TAR director representing Region 15. I'm Glenn Moss, Glenn Moss Realty. I'm a city director on the board. Teresa Scott Tibbs, I am a director 2016 to 2018, also a TAR director. I also am on the Texas Association of Realtors um, Housing Committee as your liaison at this point. Lisa Masana, this is my third year as a director on the past actress chair. My name is Jonathan Stilley. It's my uh, third year on the board. Uh, previously, legislative management team, transportation policy team, government affairs, and most importantly, I've got a two and a half year old and a five and a half month old. And if you want to see pictures, I'll be out in the lobby. Uh, <laughs> Hi, good morning. My name is Bob McKenna. I'm uh, my first year as a director at the board and also a past actress chair. Good morning, I'm Stacy Bass. I'm a broker and 
serve on the director as on the board as a director. Um, I'm a past MLS chair, government affairs chair, and served on lots of other miscellaneous committees. Um, and I appreciate you all help being here today. Good morning, I'm Steve Corey. I'm 2017 president elect of the board. I'm Kevin Scanlon. Uh, I have been active on dozens of committees and I was the chair of the Actors Committee way before Bob was. <laughs> Good morning everyone. Susan Horton, broker manager for John Horton Realty. I'm a director. I'm also a TAR director, past trustee for the Texas Association of Realtors, governmental affairs, maker of all kinds of committees, and currently serving as your pick. My name is Paul Hilgers. I am not a board member. I am the board member's only employee, and I have the pleasure of managing the best staff of any association in the United States of America, uh, many of whom who are here and the rest of whom are back uh, serving the members. So uh, thank you very much for coming. Okay, we get that done. So I have to ask somebody in charge, Jane Brady. You didn't send me up on my notes who I'm supposed to ask this question to, so I'm just going to ask if somebody knows who's going to answer. Okay, sounds good. This is the compilation question. These are the compilation questions that we've sent in over the last few weeks to the board, put together what people wanted to know the answers to. So we're going to begin with these questions. There's been a lot of feedback from the membership about transparency of the board. The discussions. Decisions made in closed meetings and what is published to the membership. So who's going to tell me what constitutes a closed meeting, also called an executive session, and why do we have them? Sure. Um, so your board of directors meetings uh, are held monthly and they're published on the website and those are an open meeting. And members do have an opportunity to uh, come and speak to the board at the beginning of those meetings where you can sign up um, and let us know so we can get you on the agenda. Uh, as far as the executive session of the meetings, the, the board uh, will go into an executive session to discuss personnel matters, uh, contract issues, or things related to finance that needed to be um, not necessarily disclosed. How does a member find out in advance what you're going to vote on at the board meeting. Um, in response to a lot of the members' input and feedback, your board has taken action and then put into place by passing motions to allow for uh, the members to be able to see the decisions that are going to, the recommendations that will be coming before the board. So now when you go onto aboard.com, um, you look under the board of directors tab, You'll see a list of all of the uh, agenda, so you'll be able to pull up the board's agenda. And at the back of that, if you scroll down, you will actually see what recommendations we're going to be considering uh, that are being brought forward by the committees. Um, so that is uh, an opportunity for you to um, then participate to sign up to speak, should you feel a particular way. That way your board of directors can hear directly from the members. What is the process to provide feedback and how is the membership informed of decisions once you think, all right, did you say all of that? The decisions will also be posted um, on the same uh, link through the website. So that will happen at the end of all of the meetings and once the minutes have been approved. This is another series of questions that you're gonna keep answering if you want to hand the mic. So <laughs> you got this? I got this. For sure? Okay. Oh, give me the chance to do that. <laughs> Please explain what is going on with CSS. Is it mandatory or not? And there's a bunch of other questions about this. I know there was a lot of confusion um, to members regarding CSS, which is the showing service that some members do use. Uh, CSS is not mandatory uh, and is not going to be made mandatory. And I'll actually read to you what the board's uh, motion was regarding CSS. Um, <coughs> that we will continue to research all of our options related to showing service within our unique marketplace and culture prior to making any decision which may disrupt your current business practice. Uh, the MLS committee is now reconsidering the best way to move forward with a product in our marketplace. And essentially, um, you know, that we have a large uh, portion of our membership that does not use this tool. We do have um, some of our membership that does use this tool 
And um, Austin is unique in the fact that we um, allow for the buyer agent to contact the seller directly. And in a lot of uh, marketplaces across the country, that, that's, that's an anomaly. It is. Okay. Does CSS have anything to do with the A4 state warm merger? Absolutely not. Um, the, uh, there were some discussions regarding the ABOR SABOR uh, merger taking place. Um, there was, uh, obviously, they do utilize the CSS as one of their products. They have the additional service where it's a phone call. Um, and so that is something that is used in San Antonio's marketplace, but that was never a deciding factor or related to the discussions related to the ABOR SABOR. So, um, oh. Um, as far as CSS goes, I view CSS as a as a tool, as a member benefit, something that's in my toolbox. I don't use it personally um, in in my day to day business, but it's something that I that I have used, and I can see a useful reason for it. I have a toolbox at home with a bunch of stuff in it that I don't know what it's for, and that I've never used for, used before. But someday I may need a flywheel pull or something like that. And so I think it's, it's, it's a useful tool for our members to have, but not to be mandatory. Okay, we're going down the path a little bit more about the emergency. Yes? Oh, down there. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. so just a quick point of clarification uh, to the Madam Chair. Uh, there was never any discussion of a or save or merger. Uh, the discussion was for the MLSs to be shared, not the associations. Okay, no one wanted that to happen. There was a discussion about the MLSs being unified. Okay, so I'll change this next question. Uh, following this, that answer that you gave a while ago, Brandy, please tell us the status of the a4 Actress and San Antonio Association's MLS merger. Currently, those conversations are um, still ongoing. Um, there have been no decisions at this point. Um, we are uh, there, we're looking at all of the options. Um, we need to do all of the due diligence to see how that would even work, to see if it would even be a possibility. Uh, to see that if it would even make sense as a benefit to the membership here. And so um, currently that there's a task force in place that is evaluating all of that in a partnership with the San Antonio um, members as well. Um, and those conversations are ongoing, but there is no decision at this time. You may have feel like you've already said this, but somebody wanted to know why would you do this? There is... Um, a lot happening um, outside of the, the Austin market. And um, what's, I have, I think as a director and along with the MLS committee, there's um, some privilege to be able to attend um, conferences on, on the membership behalf. Uh, I would think that you would want your board of directors to, to have knowledge and be, um, have training regarding what is coming down. And on a national scale, there is um, a large push to go towards consolidation. We currently have around 700 MLSs in the country. Most of those MLSs, around 400 of those, have about 100 members or less. And um, not specifically necessarily in our marketplace, but in a lot of the other areas of the country, there's a lot of overlap and disorder, and it, it creates confusion and it creates additional costs for the brokers. There's um, a lot of benefits into researching what a consolidation uh, model might look like. Uh, having an expanded uh, member count, uh, giving a larger footprint would then allow um, for different considerations when negotiating contracts. Because a lot of the times when we um, get tools of different third party vendors, whether that's an MLS system or otherwise, um, you get cost benefits based off of uh, the member count that you would have at large. Um, there's also um, a lot of interesting information regarding the expanded uh, marketplace. I know based off of the last time we made the announcement to the membership and we received all of your feedback, which was shared with this board of directors, um, there were some concerns around um, people operating in the other one's marketplace. 
And we know uh, by licensing laws and by our code of ethics that we are not allowed to you know, practice in an area that you do not have expertise in. And so um, I believe if any of this was to ever come forward down the road, um, you know, 30 years from now, that that education piece and ensuring that the brokers within our marketplace had the correct tools and resources to help educate their members and their realtor agents um, would all be part of that as well. So, you know, just on, yeah, so in addition to that, um, just from a daily how do things really work kind of thing, um, you know, our Austin market has expanded as a San Antonio's and you know, our job is to look out for everybody that is part of the Austin Board of Realtors, right? So there's a lot of people that do business in Kyle and Buda and all the way down. And there are some real legitimate logistical issues with being in, say, San Marcos, because you don't know, does my key work on this? Is that San Antonio? And if I have this and my client finds a house that they like, but it's listed in San Antonio's, how do I do a good job for them to pull comps? Because I can only pull from actors, right? So, you know, one of the things we have to look at is just because of strictly expanding geography, which is how do we serve the members the best? Because it's easy to say, let's make sure we do everything in Austin. But quite honestly, there's a lot of people that do business, you know, much further south than that, further north as far as San Antonio. We start talking about Dripping Springs out in those areas. There's lots of MLSs that are around. And we all know right now, because of the price in Austin, that many of our clients are looking further and further out to find that $250,000 house, right? And so how do we provide our members with the best information uh, available to allow all of our members to do business? And so it is incumbent upon us to at least do the research to find out how do we do that and how would this work? You know, CSS was a conversation to say it's a legitimate thing that San Antonio requires it, and we don't. That is a hurdle or an obstacle that we have to look at. So, you know, the question, is, I, as a board member, the, the first thing that I asked was, I don't care what everybody else nationally is doing. Why, why, why should I do this? It doesn't make any sense to me. I'm not going to sell houses in San Marcos, right? But when you start looking at the Sam's Club model of buying the add-ons for us, right? I mean, we're buying in bulk now, 20,000 members, 22,000 members. You get a different price point on things. And how could that affect our membership? Better tools, maybe less prices? Don't know. And, you know, uh, if we can provide this and more data for our members and we can make it work, doesn't that make sense? And before we present those kind of things to our membership, shouldn't we have the answers instead of just providing everybody with all of these questions? And so that is what the ongoing discussions have been, which are let's at least get a pretty good set of answers and figure out what this animal is going to look like before a bomb is dropped on everybody that says, hey, we're thinking about doing this. What does everybody think? So that's two cents on it. Four cents, sorry. Four cents, at least four. Okay. So maybe somebody answered this, but it's still I'm going to specifically put this out there. How did the board decide, how did the board decide to have conversations with San Antonio and was there feedback solicited from members? I'll, I'll answer that. Um, so the, the, the talks began informally in uh, probably in late um, 2015, just at conferences and, and uh, the board presidents and, and officers got together and said, hey, maybe we should explore uh, a conversation about putting our MLSs together. Uh, it makes sense on a lot of different uh, fronts, especially for our brokers. We have many brokers who have offices in both Austin and San Antonio. Um, you know, you have, I know J.P. Goodwin's got one, I know um, uh, KW, a lot, of, a lot of brokers have, have access. I have, I have agents in, um, in San Antonio as well. And so we started exploring um, those options. Again, when we started exploring it, we had no idea what it would look like. We could not go to the members and say, hey, we're going we're gonna to merge with Sabor when we don't know what it's going to look like because as a member, we might not be able to negotiate a heck of a deal that is really, really beneficial to the ABOR members, and it would make sense to everyone. Um, another reason that you can't um, publicly uh, talk about this stuff is because it creates doubt in, um, in our employees' minds. 
we, we employ over 50 members, or employ over 50 employees at ABOR. And when they start hearing merger talk, they start thinking that their jobs may not be that secure. Oh, they're talking about merger. We don't know what it's going to look like. You may not, you know, people think they may lose jobs. So that's why you don't hear about public conversations. No company talks about their mergers publicly because of those reasons. And so we don't have, we didn't have anything to bring to you guys. And I would add to it is that there was no, um, the due diligence hadn't been decided or, you know, dealt with to the point that we knew it was moving forward. And so until there was a pathway that it was going to make sense, that it that looked like it was a possibility, and we had some of the questions that members would ask, um, that uh, that all, all that due diligence and all of that information needed to be done um, to just even ensure it was even a possibility. Um, but as far as the member feedback, we, we did um, receive member feedback uh, when the announcement was made that the two, um, San Antonio and Austin and their MLSs were discussing um, those. And all of that was collected and all of that has been provided and has been incorporated in all of the decisions and discussions and all of the different things that are related to the uh, merger. Okay, I think Susan, we're down at the end. So I'd like to add to that by saying that the Austin Board of Realtors is a very large organization. <coughs> and within our policy governance documents, within our strategic plan, and within our structure, the board of directors and staff are given direction to be forward thinking, to always be good stewards of your money, to always be looking for better ways that we can serve each of you. And it's within the purview for us to go out and research, to understand what's in the marketplace, what's in other areas, what could be coming. We want to be able to know what's out there so we can better serve you. And all of those things and those guidelines are written in our policy governance documents and in our strategic plan that is set forth by each of you folks that may sit on one of those committees. Those are not things that are given to us that we just pull out of our hat. They come from you. So if you sit on that strategic plan, you helped put this piece in motion years ago before this group ever got it. And can I just say also to add to that briefly that I think the crux of the question was, and that is tree packers away. Yeah. Yeah. The, 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 the crux of that was, why did this conversation ever start? I mean, prior to the release of the information, did we get feedback? And the answer is absolutely. We had many members that were coming to us say, individual members, I'm having problems with lockboxes here and there. And we have a lot of brokers saying, God, I, you know, I have, I'm tired of being part of San Antonio and Austin and Four Rivers and, and, and. And then my agents that are in the middle not only have to learn the matrix, which is in and of itself, Right? I mean, a technological wonder to know all that. But now they've got to go down and learn San Antonio's system. And depending on who's doing it, and can't we, you know, can we do something about this? And that is an ongoing thing as the marketplace expanded. Okie dokie. So we're going to go to another series of new investment Here we go. How does the board determine what they should work on for the betterment of the organization and its members? Uh, Susan Horton actually touched on that a little bit. Um, but there's several things. Um, you know, we do have to operate through uh, our governance. Um, it is it is somewhat structured. We have uh, policies in place that we uh, adhere to and follow and agree to uh, by taking this role. Um, a lot of the objectives are put into place by the strategic plan. Um, that process, that planning process, yes, it has a, a, a you know, committee or, or people that are working on that, but I was actually part of, um, I was the chair of the last strategic planning session that we went through, and I will share with you that we um, reached out and did many, many focus groups and brought in many, many members from all um, different perspectives and areas, um, and then we even looked at um, the outside organizations that were sister to us, so our affiliates like CT Car. Uh, with the commercial, um, um, some of the, the, the uh, Chamber of Commerce, the Austin Chamber, and, and bringing a lot of those in, and, and trying to see what, um, 
how the how the outside world perceives realtors and where we can make an impact and what we can change and what we might be able to embrace. And then um, also, you know, we receive a um, survey on an annual basis. I think that we have a very um, multi-pronged approach. And then also a lot of the recommendations from the committees will come forward for, for board decision as well. And I know we're in the middle of committee sign-ups, so I'm doing a shameless plug here. You can go online and sign up for a committee, anything that you're interested in, and I hope that you will do so. I believe that that will end um, at the end of October. Great segue into how the committees play a role in the board's decision process. So the, um, the committees make recommendations to the board. The board uh, puts in place these committees to do the deep dive, to do the research, and to do all of the vetting on all of the items. And so we have specific committees that are focused around whether that might be policy and advocacy. Uh, of course, we have um, our fundraising with our PAC. We have um, the foundation, which is our philanthropic arm. We have um, bylaws and policy governance. We have our finance uh, type committees. Um, basically a wide spectrum, including MLS, um, that will do the deep dive and do all of the research and then bring forward those recommendations to the board of directors for implementation and decision. Okay, let's go to the next thing. What's happening in Acorn that you would like your members to know about other than this? <laughs> it doesn't say that I did. <laughs> Um, you know, there's a lot that's happening uh, at your association. The, the work um, has not stopped, and we have a wonderful uh, staff that helps our members every day um, just with the basic necessities, whether that's, you know, getting a key or a lockbox or going to an education class or getting additional training in one aspect or another. Um, you know, we've expanded to where we now have offerings um, north over in Cedar Park. We also have a new location down south. And this is all truly to help serve the members where the members are located. That was the vision with that. Um, we realized that you may not be close to the main headquarters. Um, of course, we do um, also have an event center uh, that's your building that you, that you own. Um, and so you're, you have the ability and, and receive a discount for being a real member on that front as well. And then um, a lot of different technology and, and tools. We've um, recently created a formalized a new process and evaluating uh, new products as they come out. Um, from an MLS, you receive all kinds of new startups and the new, uh, the new gadget, you know, gadget and those kinds of things. And so now we've um, been able to implement a, a process and a pathway for all of those products to be evaluated and um, for beta testing to happen. And the members are the ones that beta test these products to see, is this something that's going to be helpful to me in my day-to-day -day business? Is this something that's going to be helpful to my clients that I represent? Um, and then those come forward, of course, for decision as well. Um, on the advocacy front, uh, you know, it's, it's important uh, within our community that we have a strong voice. Uh, realtors' pocketbooks are always being attacked for whatever reason. Um, but, you know, we're there to ensure that we have a strong stance in the local government, state government, and even on the national front. Uh, one of the big issues that we're following right now that is going to impact every single resident in the city of Austin is Code Next. It's the rewrite of our land development code, and everybody at some point that owns a home in Austin will receive a notice about a zoning change that is going to impact what they have the ability to do with that home. And so we're following that. We're making sure that we're at the forefront um, at every opportunity that we can so we can best protect our members. Okay, that concludes the questions that were compiled from over time. And we have only one. So, so far. So far, only one. It came in through the Facebook. Facebook, see, because my favorite says Facebook. I mean, it says a bit right now, so I think it makes any sense. Okay, so here's the question. Why did the board change the rules of the nominating process? <laughs> so, board, as far as the, the rule, I, I believe, that, that is being referred to, um, is there was a, a change that was made related to um, governance. If a um, director had been removed from the board, that they would have um, to sit out a term before they could come back on. 
the board decided that that would not be implemented this year and it would not impact what was currently transpiring um, and what's happening today. And so that will go into effect um, at the beginning of next year. And there was a, um, another item that it, it appears that it was a change, but it's really not. It was pulled from another area within our governing policies that was already there that discusses that um, a member would have to have, have committee, ser uh, committee experience and or served on some other sanctioned uh, council or society. Okay. We got anything else? Uh, we're going to wait till later. Take them from the audience first. So if you're running up there, you're fixing to have a chance to come to the podium. Or we can do that later. So yeah, we're going to turn it over to Mr. Hall. Thank you, 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 Please be mindful not to repeat what someone else said or ask. Please be kind and calm. And please limit your comments to three minutes. And please tell us when you start who you are, whether you're going to ask a question or make a comment. Um, I'm going to make a lead in and, and two questions. And who are you? Ari Axelrod. Okay. So it was mentioned that the board is concerned with looking at tools and how we do business and maybe looking at safe or other places for how we would have access. So to that, I'd like to ask, one, why the board declined a reciprocity agreement with Wilco, which is immediately adjacent to us, and two, why the board hasn't pursued joining CTX MLS who is on the same system as we are, whereas Sabor is on DynaConnect for the next four or five years. Thank you. That was way less than three minutes. <laughs> Thank you. Um, you want to wait while somebody answers? No. I think that was, those are great questions, so appreciate that. Um, so as far as the uh, reciprocity, um, that is something that is still uh, being considered and will be discussed by the board. Um, the board is actually looking at a policy that would relate to all uh, associations that may have that similar request. That way we would have something more formalized in place that we can follow uh, from a governance perspective um, and that that will be ongoing. Um, I do believe that um, we are always looking at opportunities, whether they are any MLS, neighboring or otherwise to see if there's going to be any benefits to our members and what that might be able to bring. So that also is ongoing. Okay. Name, comment, question? Hold on just one second. Oh, wait. There's, 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 there's a little bit of a thought about that. And, and that it, it seems very easy for us to just talk about lockboxes. Williamson County owns theirs and we own ours and they should all be the same. But there are different business models that have to do with you know, where those dollars come from for lot boxes, some associations charge, some of them don't. And it's not really a question of do you want to do it or not, but it is truly the logistics of, you know, how does that work, right? I mean, if we're charging X amount for a lot box and there's a rental fee that goes along with that and they're charging more, you know, we want to make sure that it's equitable across the board for everybody and make sure they're all speaking. So there, there's just some, there's some larger things than just, let's just sign a paper and everybody can, you know, go into everybody's lot box. Mark Aaron, thank you for being here, everyone. Um, I've known the majority of you for close to a decade now. You are good folks and you do a good job. I want to harken back to what Brandy just mentioned. That's code next. Our neighborhoods, our affordability problem. Uh, and most of you know how intensely and for how long I've followed that. As of yesterday, the cheapest new housing unit in Central Austin under the proposed code will be $600,000. And the whole conversation so far has been carried on at price levels of that $600,000 or higher. In order to bring that down to 300,000, I'm talking condos, townhomes, whatever you want to build. And these are not my 
out of left field kind of projections. I've vetted these numbers with several high profile housing developers in Austin. The cheapest single family home in central Austin will be a million and a half on new product. In terms of the amount of capacity we have to continue building homes in Austin, the maximum, being very generous to the consultants and the staff and everybody else, we will have probably six or seven years of housing until there's no place left to put a house within the city limits of Austin. Those are the numbers that are in the most current spreadsheets that were released last week. We got to do something. And we can't delegate that to my good friend Chris Riley. We have got to jump in and be much more aggressive and forceful. We have an ethical seconds. We have an ethical obligation under our NAR code of ethics to do exactly that. We need to, to start on it. Thank you. Okay. Is there anybody wishes to say anything at all about that? Well, we've got a bunch of people on the microphone soon. I'd like to say that first of all, um, you know, we had a forum regarding this and I would like to think that ABOR had something to do with the fact that Code Next is being rewritten. Because basically the first draft has been thrown out and you, I'm not on the legislative management team, but um, just from what we did as board members and I attended the forum and, and I think that ABOR, um, our advocacy has been working really hard on that because we get it. And the first Code Next draft wasn't doing anything for the number of homes, they weren't increasing you know, it, anywhere near what we need to be doing. It wasn't helping as much as they claimed it was going to. And I think that ABOR had a really big part in that. We fought really hard and we've got great relationships with um, Chris Riley, but some of the other council members. And I think abor has been working really hard on that. I mean, maybe somebody from the LMT can answer that better than me, but um, it's my understanding that we, we were fighting really hard to get Code Next, the copy that they had or the version they had wasn't working and that we were very vocal about that. And we've been working really hard on that. Our LMT team has been amazing. Let me add to that. I, I mentioned in, in my intro that uh, I'm, I'm the chair this year of the policy team that's focused on Code Next. Frank and I have spent a lot of time talking about this, along with a lot of others. Um, but the real key to Code Next is really five years older than that, and that is Imagine Austin's comprehensive plan that the city of Austin adopted on purpose. <laughs> And you, you probably have heard the tagline compact and connected. It uh, says that the only solution to the growth patterns and growth problems that the city of Austin has is increased density. And, and frankly, densifying the ATJ is not going to solve much because we don't have a transit system that doesn't support that either. So uh, the, the current, well, Lisa mentioned that the first draft uh, was universally hated and thrown out. And so about two weeks ago, we got a second draft which appears to make some pro progress, but uh, some of you that have been part of my policy team have heard me say this before. There are, uh, as part of the Imagine Austin, it was added early this year, I guess, the Strategic <coughs> Housing Blueprint uh, says that we need 135,000 new dwelling units in the city of Austin in the next 10 years just to keep up with projected population growth. And that, that's not enough, frankly, to affect affordability. That's just keeping up. Uh, there are also some smart people that think we're already 48,000 dwelling units behind. So if you combine those, that's 183,000 housing units we need in the city of Austin, preferably as close to the center of Austin as possible, uh, in the next 10 years. And uh, uh, the mayor has been saying that this is going to impact maybe 2 or 3% of the city. So think about that. We're 326 square miles. 3% is 10 square miles, 183,000 dwelling units in 10 square miles, and that's assuming there's nothing else there, which is not true about any of those 10 square miles the way the corridor is <coughs> that's what I've outlined right now. So this, this is a tough problem, it's one we're working hard on, and one that does need a lot of attention and a lot of immediate attention, because something is going to get adopted likely early part of next year, and it, it needs to be something that implements Imagine Austin and helps to make some real progress on the growth patterns and the uh, problems that are coming with what we're not managing growth right now. The only other thing that I would add to that is that this organization is a member-driven organization. It's led by members, realtor members, 
I practice day to day just like you, and we need you. And so the Code Next policy team um, needs individuals that may have an interest in this. Um, we need to start making an appearance as realtors um, and sharing our thoughts uh, with the Planning Commission, <coughs> the Zoning and Planning Commission as well. And so definitely if this is something that um, it's going to impact everybody. So if it's something that you're interested in, um, again, please please sign up and get involved. You hear me all talking? Okay. <laughs> Quick. I should have given you all time. <laughs> Frank, I couldn't agree more. Um, I am also the Vice Chair of the Leasing and Property Management Committee. We also have the same situation regarding tenants. On one hand, we have the owners that want to squeeze out every dollar, then they have tenants saying that the prices are too high. Um, Bill is very uh, much involved with everything we can do here, but I'm fully supportive. If you have any ideas, and, and I know you have, please please continue with your service. Thank you. I'm, I'm not going to ask anyone to talk again, so if you can go ahead and tell me your name. Your name is Lonnie Monreal, and I'm a broker, and just have a comment that I want to make in support of uh, ABOR and the board. And uh, I was uh, with uh, several other realtors a couple of nights ago, and uh, they basically blasted uh, me and steamrolled me because uh, uh, their brokers are people that are at odds uh, with the board right now and uh, uh, have a problem with what they think uh, y'all are doing and uh, the interactions you're having with San Antonio. But I'm gonna tell you that I love Austin, uh, I love Avor, and uh, I love America. And uh, I get up every day and uh, I, I try to have the intent to be the happiest man that I can be. And uh, I think that what y'all are doing, every one of you, uh, that are a director and involved with ABOR are helping us as realtors. And uh, since I've been a member of ABOR, uh, sometimes I wish my dues were a little lower because I'm a little guy. But uh, I, I believe you've done nothing but help Austin, uh, help me, uh, help realtors. And uh, <coughs> as I was talking to these gentlemen, I, I said, uh, how about the Houston Metro? I mean, you're, you're saying we, we shouldn't expand it. We shouldn't be have a bigger vision. And uh, I said, how about Dallas-Fort Worth? And uh, what I'm saying is you can't have too big a vision, uh, especially uh, the way Austin is growing. And I gave him the example of uh, Op City. I have a friend, I, I don't know if any of you know who Op City is, but uh, they're an Austin-based firm. They're closing over 400 deals a month. Uh, they'll, they'll probably be closing 500 a month by the end of the year. And uh, they're moving to uh, a new complex. And the, the thing that I'm saying is with the technology, uh, with the internet, uh, we've got to broaden our horizons. We've got to broaden our vision. And these people right now that are spending lots of energy and lots of money uh, to criticize you, uh, to oppose you, uh, I don't want to have that small vision. I want to have the vision that you have. Uh, I support you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Thanks for uh, being here, everyone. Appreciate it. Stephen Bear, broker here for Four Directions Realty, several other businesses. Um, speaking to the affordability and and um, you know our duties to our clients and so many of the issues that we're having around that issue. But coming from that uh, finding need, fill a need place, the social worker in here, I guess. Um, I created a product. We've been open less than a year, and it's aimed directly at that situation. Uh, we're, being, we're building container homes, and uh, in just less than a year, less than a year. We have 800 people that want us to build for them. We're getting ready to put something like 500 units on the ground. The biggest demand we have is for housing under 1,000 square feet. And within the city of Austin, we can't build it unless we build it in somebody's backyard. You know, we really need some support there. 
we can build this product. It's affordable. It's durable. It's sustainable. It's net zero. We can solve a lot of problems. We can go down to the coast and build it up over the coast and save people's lives and their houses will still be there after that storm was through. And a lot of other things. There are solutions out there. We just have to get outside the box. There's solutions out there for all of these things we're talking about. We just have to get outside the box. Or in my case, get inside the box. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We're each capable of creating solutions, you know, find the need, fill the need. We're trying to do that. Sometimes the people that we're trying to do it for need our help. And sometimes the people that we have to do it with need us to show them. We got the numbers. You know. And we're having to go out to Maynard and out to Elevin and out to the, you know, the ETJs to build. Because unless we can put in somebody's backyard, we can't come here 900 square feet in the city of Austin. There's a demand there. They can solve the problem. We could use guys helping that. Thank you. Um, the only other thing that I would um, offer to that, thank you so much. Um, part of the advocacy efforts, um, the Austin Board of Realtors, I guess four, four or five years ago, uh, decided that we would not just um, do hill visits to the state of Texas, that we would also do that to um, our local government. And so um, we will be attending uh, city hall visits for Austin, and that will be coming up October 25th from 9 to 1230. You can sign up off of the website if you're interested in coming and, and, and speaking with the mayor on these issues, and all of our city council uh, members will have that ability to do that. We're also going to be uh, visiting with our Cedar Park uh, council members as well at some point. Uh, but if you'll go to the website, all of that information will be there. So, the 16th. Thank you. I'm Michael Brown with Avalar Real Estate. Based on the court decision yesterday, can you articulate what's going to happen with the election going forward? Are you ready to do that yet? And can you, uh, in detail, tell us what's going to happen going forward? Joe Bev is here, if you would rather. <laughs> So the board will, will have a further meeting, but um, <laughs> the way that the, the court ruled is that the two additional seats um, would be up for vote. And um, based off of that, we are working with our vendor. Um, we are going to do this voting uh, system electronically. You'll receive uh, an email notification. We'll ensure that um, the board of directors and, and that you get enough communication to ensure that you know where to go and how to vote. Um, and essentially, you will have the ability to uh, select seven uh, individuals on that. The voting period will be open for about four days, I believe. Um, our timelines have been uh, delayed a little bit uh, just based off of the reconfiguration. Um, but I believe the timeline will be somewhere around October 12th through 17th. But we'll make sure that we've got all of those details um, ironed out and uh, that we communicate that to all of our members. Uh, that way you have your opportunity. Do we have to go somewhere? Before we have to go no, it'll be electronic. Oh. <coughs> yes, ma'am? Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Pam Draba, and I have been a realtor for coming up on uh, 23 and a half years. Um, I'm with Four Directions Realty, and uh, I am a broker. I'm not the broker or record for the company. But I'm here because I, we're talking about elections, kind of help me slide in. And thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Board of Directors, and thank you, Avis. My question is, I heard you're gonna tweak the bylaws um, maybe I heard wrong that you would, if someone is removed from the board of directors, that they would not be able to serve, um, for, they'd have to sit out a term before they can run again. If you're going to tweak the bylaws, and I highly recommend and advocate you to consider changing and rewriting the bylaws so that each year the membership is allowed to vote, not just this year, but in following years. I'm glad to see, I'm getting email messages from people 
that the nominating committee recommended, as well as the slate of seven candidates that have moved forward. I'm glad I'm getting communication on this so I can make an informed decision as a member of who I get to cast a vote for. That is important to me, and I'm sure it's an important for most of our members to have a say in who actually serves on the Board of Realtors. So I'd like you to consider rewriting the bylaws, not the whole bylaws, but incorporating an election process. Our friends to the north, our friends in Houston, they have this process. I'd like to see our board have this process. We've grown. It's time we make some changes. And um, I am willing to sit on the committee and help and or chair. Thank you. other clarification just because I want to make sure everybody has the right information um, so that change is not a bylaws change um, the way that the policies are written in the bylaws um, it was a change to a policy that's related to the bylaws Thank you. Thank you. And let me confirm something with your attorney but if there is a bylaws change that has to go to the National Association of Realtors for affirmation is that correct it doesn't yeah. yes. check they have to approve it. So it's not a bylaw change, it's positive. And then the membership would then vote on it. And then the, yeah, after any are, then the membership. Hi there, my name is Teresa Brown, and I've been a realtor here for about 10 years, and I have the privilege this year to be the chair of the housing committee as well as being a director on the foundation, um, also Board of Realtors Foundation. And one thing I would like to clarify is all of you are volunteer, correct? Nobody gets paid. Right. Right. Including all of the committees and the task force and whatnot. Yeah, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and in my experience, I had a lot of experience with large boards helping with board meetings, council meetings, executive sessions, facilitating meetings on high level. In my understanding, with executive session um, for any board is extremely important so that you guys can actually sit and hash out as volunteers, as our peers, and have an open dialogue between yourselves without the repercussions of members or others asking their opinion, so that you guys can come forward and in open session be as one voice. And I would like to acknowledge you all. I don't know that a lot of people understand the rules and engagements of boards, especially a volunteer board. There are bylaws and there are standards and rules of operation that you have to follow. And I personally commend you for doing that and taking the heat that you have, especially volunteering, because I know I think all of us would rather just continue to do good versus have to, to deal with what we're dealing with right now. Um, I would like to ask quickly, Yes, to, if you can confirm from the last lady's perspective, um, as far as a, being elected or appointed to the board, I know at one point, from what I understand, we have been, um, we had votes, and then it went to an election process or an appointment process based on the community review, volunteering, <coughs> how much involvement you've had in the community and on the board. Can you further expand as to why? it went from a voting process to an appointment, and now, of course, the heat's on to go back to the voting. Okay, so we're done. So, so I will um, explain the way that it's outlined within the bylaws. So each organization has um, you know, their rules and their policies and the things that they operate off of. Uh, the way that the Austin Board of Realtors operates is within the election process, we have a nominating committee. Uh, that is outlined in the bylaws on who would serve on that committee. And then they, um, you know, basically we launch uh, applications and encourage people to apply for the board and for the leadership positions. Uh, that usually that goes out on an annual basis on May 15th. The applications close on June 30th. And the nominating committee then contacts all of the references that were listed for those individuals. They go through a vetting process. They um, are researched to see if there's ever been any complaints uh, locally or at the state. Uh, and then they go through an interview process. And so you uh, historically have received an email 
Um, and it's in our bylaws, prior to August 31st, you'll receive an email that will state the slate, the nominating slate of those individuals that were selected from that process. On September 1st through September 30th, there is an opportunity for a petition to come forward. There's some um, bylaws clarifications in there that states that it has to be 5% of the membership total and that it cannot have more than 25% from one office. Uh, if a petition is filed and successful, then that then gets ratified and then you will um, be sent out for a vote. Um, if there are no petitioners uh, on a, an annual basis, then what was announced on August 31st moves forward. And that has been our process. Yeah, Susan, I want to say something quick. I am part of the bylaws committee and I just want to make everybody aware that these bylaws are in, line, in alignment with the National Association of Realtors Bylaws, and they're also in alignment with the Texas Association of Realtors Bylaws. And if you would go to those sets of bylaws, you'll see that our uh, nominating process mirrors their nominating process almost verbatim. It is not something that we chose or put into place. It is something that came from the National Association of Realtors. Okay, we're going to have to wait. I know it's on that subject, but you can come back to the microphone. Okay, yes, sir. Who are you? What's your name? I am Rick Ebert. I am the owner and operator of Austin Landmark Property Services. I've been a member for 30 years. My claim to fame is I've never sold a house to anybody to live in. So, <laughs> so said that, we are not getting what we need from our board and the property management lease industry in order to be successful in our industry. Do you know that there are more lease listings than the MLS and our sales listings? You know there's fit over 53 percent of the people in austin are renters and yet we're underrepresented in, in our industry up until night up until 2015 we used to get the statistical information for our board the number of lease listings that were the average price of a house in austin and what and what all this represented and we use this to to market to our tenants and also to our owners that's gone away we want that back we've been promised this for two years that's coming well, so it's Christmas and so is the second coming of know who, but it hasn't happened yet, so we want that back. The board took away from us the representation that we have of the property management committee. It came back after a lot of protests. Now it's come back where we have four meetings a year instead of 12. We can't get our job done with 12, with, with, with four meetings, we need 12. So we want our information, we want representation, and we want it now. I don't want to hog this, but I do want to point out a couple of things. Most of you, maybe some of you, heard my personal story last month at the board of directors meeting. I went through the process as our bylaws state. My resume is packed. And quite frankly, the year that I ran for board of directors, my resume was superior to my peers, but I was not given an opportunity. They turned me down. I'm trying to take out that choice that the board makes, that nominating committee, on who actually gets the opportunity to move forward and who does not. The bylaws can be rewritten. And yes, there is a process. It has to be approved by the National Association of Realtors. But I think that if you want to run, your members, our members, me, should have an opportunity to say, yes, I want you as on my board versus a committee that sits behind a closed door and says, no, Pam Drawbaugh, you weren't good enough. And again, the story I told, I'm not going to repeat, but it gives everyone who is at least a member of this association for two years, I know there would have to be some minimum standards, I'm not asking to do away with those, but to give everyone an equal fair share to run. And then you have the say whether I'm elected or not. Thank you. Come on. Hi, 
afternoon, Harmony Jones Peterson. Um, my question is in regard to uh, showing instructions and agent remarks being available outside of um, Matrix. Is that something, and it's, again, our neighbors to the north, I know they have access to that. And um, is that something, is there a reason why that's not available on our back ends of our individual brokerages, where we can see that information easily with all of our contacts and our transactions and so on? Uh, maybe I'm make for myself clear. Um, so when I, I'm, a, I'm an employee and a realtor at Redfin. Yes, and so we have a really great website and a back end and that, that helps us all work uh, smoothly. But I have to log on every time to do a showing to see if I need to contact the seller or if it's agent attended or so on. And almost all the information is available to me in the back end with the exception of the showing instructions and um, the agent remarks. So I'm guessing that's something that can be done. I'm just wondering why it's not. Thank you for the clarification. Uh, so Redfin can download that information. And it's my understanding that they may have access to it already. I'm, it might just be me getting in contact uh, with their, their IT staff and figuring out what the issue is. But brokers have access to that information if they request it. Okay. Um, first of all, thank you for all of you being here and answering all the questions. Um, I've been a member of uh, Board of Realtors for 34 years. I started when we had the books. <laughs> and so I always feel like our board has been really excellent and one of the best in the country. And we have done such a good job. Austin is always in advance over all the boards. We always take the technology, take the tools and use it for our members. And I've been um, in many, many committees. As a matter of fact, I was at the first committee we decided to have MLS. First committee to have lockbox. We always tried to help the members. And I want you, the only thing I would ask for you to do Remember the members. There are some that do certain way of working, you know, individuals. There are companies. There are, uh, just think about every individual that gets up every morning and wants to make a living and depends on the board doing their job. And do not get anybody in that has a special agenda for themselves. Please, I ask you that. And the next thing about the code next. You know, I've been to many, many neighborhood associations. I'd like you all to come to the neighborhood associations because that's where all those decisions are made. I'm a contact team for the West Austin Neighborhood Association with the City of Austin. So every time there is a code decision made, our committee, which is only six, seven people that volunteers, Besides the whole thing about the West Austin, and I don't see any of you there, and you're selling real estate down there, and you don't know what kind of decisions are made. You need to be at those committees and deciding rather than five people who do not want the Austin to grow at all, making all the decisions. And that's the biggest problem we have that for the last 30 years that I've been a member of those boards, it's happening and none of us get involved with it. Please do that. Thank you. Thank you. I was here before you, but I called on you first. So to the gallery against the wall. He said I'm sorry. <laughs> um, all right, so I, so I wanted to understand the thought process, and I know that we're, you know the petition's already done and that's been certified, but I want to understand the thought process. When the board had almost a year's advance notice that it made a decision to accept electronic type submissions. And then what I heard out of the board was, we can't validate, we don't have an effective way to validate that the people that are signing the electronic signatures are who they are. So based upon that representation, my question is this, how do you validate signatures any better? I have no idea who gets that question. <laughs> 
So when we went through, we looked at all these things to say, the first thing is we, we can't do it on a system that would provide, that somebody would have to pay for, right? Because even now, if you talk about voter ID stuff on regular elections, it becomes a question of, I can't get to this, it costs me $12 disenfranchising people. So the obvious answer for us would have been Authentisign, which is something that is provided for everybody. Then it becomes a question of how do you set those things up and what, how do you prevent an, an easy button, uh, which is, you know, we go out and say, hey, here's this thing, we're going to blast it out to 13,000 members and people are going to sign it. The spirit of the petition was that the nominating process set up by NAR was that you would go through and you would participate, you would be part of whatever's going on with the organization, you would be vetted, you would have your references called. If you're going to petition, it should be that you get in front of your constituents. I chose not to go through the process, or I did, and I wasn't selected either way. Um, and so now then, I'm choosing to petition, which is absolutely your right, and makes that, if you get the signatures, every bit as valid as anybody else that's on the ballot, period. So, if you take it and make it a straight digital signature that is now social media, or whatever the world that might be, um, then that takes away part of the step that was in the spirit of that. And the second thing becomes, it is one thing to sit and hand forge, you know, 580 signatures, right? How do you do that? And, and then have to go fill in uh, their office ID and their member ID and their contact information. But it's real simple to go plug that stuff into a spreadsheet and pop it into and create 580 Gmail accounts and do those things. There's still a validation process. There's still something the staff is going to have to do to validate it. But the real answer and the, the easy answer, and actually what I should say is the correct answer instead of the fast answer, is to do it through the same system that we pay our dues with. You log in to abor.com to go pay your dues, you're validated, that's it, right? And so the systems within the back end of this are not set up. It is, it is code that has to be written. The people that, the people that are doing our elections coming moving forward and the independent third party vendors that we vetted to do a petition, right? The guys that do HAR, the people that are gonna do this one, et cetera, they are set up to do elections. And logistically and functionally, it works different than a petition. The way, the way you log in, is it individual, is it groups? And so our task was to get the right answer and not a fast answer, and to get the right answer for the long term. Because if that code is written where we can now have petitions and elections, which I suspect will be coming in the future, because just because we've hired a third party to do the elections this year, does not mean that that answer is still not being worked on on the back end for Austin. Because what we don't want to see is us having to rent election processes and petition processes year after year when they pop up. It's not a good use of members' money when we can spend a one-time fee and have the answer in a product that we already own, right? So that petition process is being worked on as we speak uh, through MMSI. Quite honestly, when it was brought up uh, originally about looking at the different things it was kind of looked at, there were so many things that were going on that it was not at the forefront of designing to do that stuff until it got kind of close and we realized that there might be a petition happening and that was in August or September. Uh, 
Okay, Ariana, Pam, come back and we'll make you come back. I just wanted to clarify. Oh, okay. Yes. Sorry. I thought well, you meant to go back from the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> I can't hear you. You're so <laughs> oh, I just think loud enough. No, Tongue in cheek. I guess what I'm getting at is this it's incumbent upon the board that when you bring us as the membership a bylaws change, which was approved by the membership <laughs> last year on that specific issue. Why did it have to wait? It doesn't make sense to me that you waited until you had no other option. Is essentially what you're telling us. That's, I would say that that is, that is fairly accurate. I mean, it was being looked at, but it wasn't a, a high priority at the time because at the time when that was passed, there was no uh, looming petition. There was no looming uh, election. Uh, and so then it becomes a question of uh, making sure that it's done right for the long term and something that our membership owns. Did she say that it would be easier to create 500 email addresses than to change your signature to forge? Yeah, I, I did say that, yeah. Do you believe that? I do believe that. Okay. Wait, 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 I don't believe so 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 you are. I, I'm Ryan Bowden back to Spyglass. Okay. Okay. Uh, and and more, more importantly, it, it was really a question of when you look at the potential issues, whatever in the world it is, again, after talking like to- Like custody? A big pardon? Like chain of custody? Correct. So when we looked at um, those and we looked at lining things up with our bylaws, which do say allow for digital signatures, the right answer, period, is to have the petition process as well as the election process hosted in the back end of abor.com, the MMSI system that allows you to pay your dues. And I believe in the last board meeting, uh, one of the ladies that spoke said that specifically, which was if I can pay my dues online, my credit card goes in there, why can't I vote online? Absolutely, we agree with that completely. And so that is what is being worked on so that by the next election cycle, I would suppose, and I will not be on the board next year, but uh, I suppose that by the next election cycle, um, those things will be available if there is another petition that happens or if the bylaws get changed per PAM that we're doing a, a whole election, even if there's only a nominated slate, that you would simply log in to MMSI and be able to vote. And do you realize that the act of the uh, wet signatures, how that looked on the board with regards to a possible 14 of the uh, petitioner's actions? Possible, I'm sorry, I, I misunderstood the board, the possible what? The perception to the membership of the wet signatures uh, seemed like a thwarting of the petition process. Right, and so I will say that that may be a perception, uh, and a lot of that is because it was put out there that, that that was a thwarting of a process that had been in place for 30 or 40 years. We literally voted not to change anything because we didn't feel on any front, whether it is nominated uh, people from the nominated slate or potential candidates or petitioners, to change the rules on anybody in the election. We didn't think it was a fair thing to do. And that's a great answer. I just have to tell you that it doesn't seem that way to the membership. And you know, I guess my final question is, there's been a, a lot of questions and decisions in the last two months. Is there anything you'd go back and regret that you'd do over again? I think the only thing that um, from, a, from the petition process, et cetera, is to say that from a timing standpoint, um, and understand that there were many things that happened prior to this, right? We know about the uh, San Antonio Austin talks, so, you know, many things were happening with membership, etc. If anything, uh, I think that it would have been better if we would have been able to get the petition process and the election process housed in MMSI earlier, at the very least, had done that complete due diligence to know that, hey, this is really the right answer. And even if we don't have a petition next year, or this year, and we don't have anything going on, we need to know that we have those answers that are there. Uh, and quite honestly, between what's happened with this, uh, the look into some real specific things, what we realize is that our bylaws that have been around for a long time were written when the association was much smaller. And quite honestly, we've gone from a few hundred to 13,000 members. And as things change, you think about our Texas Constitution where you've got still laws in the books that say you can't carry wire cutters in your back pocket, right? There are lots of inconsistencies and holes in the bylaws that when you only have 300 people, it's not that big of a deal. When you have 13,000, it's got to run like that. And quite honestly, uh, some of the bylaws committee things are going to be looked at here very soon 
uh, are housekeeping items that are just kind of a mess. I mean, some things that you say, God, there really should be a data event for this. There should be, this job description is in the wrong place. It needs to be over here. So there's a lot of things that have to be cleaned up and that's what's being worked on. So if, if anything, and I'm not that silver lining guy because I hate people that always say, yeah, look at the silver lining because sometimes it's, there's no silver lining that's there. But the fact that there is so much light being shed on our bylaws in general, and not the esoteric legal terms of bylaws, but specifically how does this work every day for our members, and to clean those things up, not to the advantage or disadvantage of somebody, but to the clarity of everybody, because that's where the crux of the argument is. I think it means this, I think it means this. It's a bylaw, there really shouldn't be an interpretation. So that I would say that would be my answer. Thank you. Kevin, did you have something you want to say this, man? I, I would. Um, so, just to, to dovetail uh, with what uh, Jonathan said, you know, I am a member, and, and when we talk about things like we, the board of directors, I really don't like that because I'm not a we and you're not a they, right? I'm one of you, and I chose to volunteer to do this to help steward this organization in a directive, in a direction that will help all of us. And there is no hidden agenda and there is no conspiracy. And I believe that what's happening now is a good thing. And, and would I change if I could the circumstances that brought this about? Of course, of course I would. But I think that having this town hall and having a slate of petitioners um, coming and doing what is in the bylaws. This petition process is one of the bylaws and it's no less valid than any other bylaw that's on the book. And I, and I believe everyone here, supports that process and supports the right for that to happen. And so, you know, as Jonathan mentioned, are the bylaws perfect? <laughs> no, they're not. Um, is this process that we're all going through, all 13,000 of us going through, a good thing? It's a great thing. And we want to increase the transparency. And frankly, we would love for more members to volunteer and be a part of helping to move this, this association forward for what is only for the greater good. I'm only here for the greater good. And when I put on my board of directors hat, I put my all city real estate hat to the side and I make decisions only based on what I believe is the best for the majority of the membership. And frankly, I know that Cord and Brian did that too, okay? And if I could go back and change the way things went down, I would do that. But here we are, let's move forward and try and get to a place where we have harmony here again. And I think we can do that. I think that's what Say one, one thing. I, I don't think I've met you before, but uh, your your answers have been one of the most honest that I've seen in, in the conversations. <laughs> and the message behind our efforts for the petitions have been nothing but positive. I've heard a lot about negativity, and um, I think from our standpoint, what we've seen is, like you say, that everything that's happened in the last couple months has been great. And um, like you, I see some really positive changes in any more future ahead of us. Yeah. 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 You're in line. All of you leaning against the wall, or you just leaning against the wall, or you're in line. All of you are this way in line. Oh, you want to talk? Finally. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a morning person, so I will talk. Uh, you know, leadership. I, I, I appreciate everyone being here. I'm excited about hitting this board next year. Leadership is difficult. Uh, volunteer leadership is even more difficult. This is a, a, a very large, it's a very large company that we're running up here. Uh, we, we have governance issues that we have to deal with and, and sometimes those decisions are hard. We don't make knee-jerk decisions on things. We, we actually set up task force or analyze things, whether it's the San Antonio thing or even the nominating process. It takes months and months of analyzing. We have nothing but the best interest for the association and our members 
all the time, every decision that we make. And, and I want you to feel confident that when you hear about backroom meetings or secret meetings, we have executive session stuff that we do talk about contracts and money and maybe personnel issues that are not that are not privy to be out there in the public, at least initially. So we, we always you know work very, very hard. I've been working for this association or volunteering for over 15 years, just like many of these people. Every committee I've probably chaired, like many of these people, I know a lot about this association from finances to to advocacy, to policy, to education, to how we're structured. And I hope that you would want the people that sit on this board to feel the same, to have the same expertise and knowledge, maybe from a business perspective, but that have really dedicated themselves to understanding what we're up here for. We're all volunteer, non-paid leaders that, again, have nothing but the best interest for this association in mind. I'm, I'm happy to look forward to more town hall meetings uh, in the coming year. Um, I think it's great. I think it's great member input, whether it's we're not listening to the leasing management committee as enough or we're not doing something on advocacy, but that's how we get feedback from you guys on what we work on and how we best serve our membership. On average, we have public meetings. Our, our monthly meetings are open to the members. We may have one person or zero all year long, unless there's some topic that's thrown out there, whether it's true or misinformation. But come to our meetings, join our, our committee structure, understand what we're doing up here because everyone, whether it's us or our committees, have all the members at best interest at heart. We actually are doing amazing things as a board and, and what's happening now can be a positive. We're willing to look at things and see what's best going forward for our membership. But don't don't you know have misconceptions that we're anybody up here other than good-hearted people just like you that are doing good things for our association, for our members, every day. Hi, my name is Pam Walkholtz. Um, I'm a realtor with Home City. Um, I spoke last month, and first of all, I've served on many volunteer boards like the last 20 or so years, so I applaud and thank you for your time and your service. However, um, the fact that you say that you want us to be involved, you want to hear from us, the fact that it takes two weeks to sign up in advance to speak before a board meeting, I said it last month and I'll say it again, it's ridiculous. The legislature, if you want to speak before a committee, they usually have a sign up before that committee meets. School board, same thing, you meet an hour, you have to sign up usually an hour before, at least the same day. Other government boards that I've served on, you sign up that day. You don't have to give two weeks notice. We're realtors. If I have a big client that's coming in that I don't know in two weeks, I'm not going to be here. I'm going to be showing houses. So I think, I mean, that seems like such a minor change. And I think it would really affect the participation of the members with the board. So that's all. taken lightly at our last um, board meeting and so we um, are allowing and changing the policy that was in place regarding member uh, to speak obviously part of that is in line with uh, the membership being able to understand what decisions or considerations the board's going to be looking at and so we're trying to get that more streamlined and, and give everybody the right opportunity um, and obviously you will not know two weeks in advance what the board decision is and what you might want to come by. So we're, we are addressing that and, and we will take um, member input at any time. And here more recently, we've actually been um, allowing the opportunity for people who may have just arrived to be having the opportunity to speak. So thank you. So the And I just wanted to piggyback on what Pam said, and that is, is that to my knowledge, no board member or no, no association member has ever been denied the opportunity to speak. We truly want you folks to be there. And, and if you can't if you can't be there, there is a means for you to get in touch with us via email. All of our email addresses are posted on the website uh, and now all on Facebook for you. So contact us, tell us what you want, and, and I promise you will get a response. You're on. Uh, hi, my name is Jonathan Boatwright, um, Fulte Austin. Um, I'm one of the petitioners that's um, 
My name is Jonathan Wilkwright from Lindsay Austin. Um, I'm one of the uh, petitioners, um, some of the other individuals over here. But I have a few questions um, that I also want to answer. Um, what is regarding the reciprocal lockbox treatment of Williamson County and Central Texas MLS? Um, I have different information from the incoming president of Central Texas MLS who says there are not any hurdles to this reciprocal lockbox sharing aside from a one page form that we signed as Supra. So I would like to understand how it's a hurdle that they purchase the same lockboxes differently than our members who actually don't own their lockboxes and probably don't realize they're leasing them anymore. Why is that a hurdle exactly? Can you explain that in more detail? Who's got that? And no, keep in your time, so we're going to pause on your yeah, time. Pause. Yeah. And, so, and so I think right now, uh, where the board is trying to come from is a place of under, having a, 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 creating a policy that is going to be able to work with not just one association, but all associations. Uh, a guideline, so to speak, that we'll have the ability to follow because we'll have more requests than just um, Williamson County. We, we have received more requests than just Williamson County. And so having a full understanding of what that means and how that would be implemented, that's what this board is working on. Haven't we gone down that path before with some other boards? I'm sorry? Haven't we already established reciprocal agreements with some other boards? We do have um, a reciprocal agreement with another um, association, yes. And so I think what we're trying to do is make sure that we have um, a policy in place from a governance perspective so that way when any request is received we have that uh, on how that will be implemented and facilitated are you afraid it could be seen as anti-competitive that you've done this with other boards but will not do it with our neighbors to the north we are not stating that we are not doing that with the neighbors to the north um let me be very clear this is something that we're working on and we are really trying to be um, thoughtful about what that means for all associations from the, across the state what's the timeline on that project um we're hopefully it'll be before the end of the year obviously we have not had an opportunity to continue some of the work that we had been working on um with some of the things that have transpired but yes hopefully by the end of the year Okay, new subject. Um, in addition to the rule, the director, that you guys changed the job description a little bit ago for the director's job description. Um, the things that seem like they should be part of the bylaws to me, but they're part of the job description now. Um, you changed the rules so the director can't serve if you remove them um, starting next year. Didn't you also pass a rule to change the job description that a member cannot petition unless they went through your nominating process starting next year? <coughs> Actually, that that is correct. We did we did make no, it's not correct. That is that is that is, that is not true. The job it's description is out there. That is those are recommendations that came to a so committee. That was a recommendation that didn't be, uh, along, along, okay. along with that, uh, along with um, much to what Pam had talked about, uh, an actual set uh, criteria for people to come through to uh, a numeric scoring system to remove some of that ambiguity, much like. You know, lots of your agents at uh, Platinum Top 50, they have those kind of things that points are allotted um, so that there is a lot less ambiguity in the interview process and it's more of a spreadsheet, metrics based. You know, this person is a 96 uh, as opposed to when I talked to the referral, they said this, and when I talked to them, they said that. And so there are a lot of recommendations that have gone into that, <coughs> that nominating process much more objective and a lot less subjective. Thank you. Um, Next question, regarding the two seats that the judge ruled yesterday must be on the ballot, uh, Cord and Ryan's former seats, which had to have temporary appointments. Um, have you decided how the seats will be filled? It seems to us that the only fair approach would be that the second, that this sixth seat, which had, have a, I'm sorry, the two year remaining seat, would be for the person with the sixth most votes, and then the one year remaining seat would go to the person with the seventh most votes. If the first five positions go into full terms, does that sound like a reasonable approach to you guys to pick what these seats would be? So, so I, the the board has not had a meeting or an opportunity to meet since the um, hearing that took place yesterday. So, um, I I cannot speak for the board as they have not deliberated or been updated on that. But I would um, state from my personal opinion that I believe that that is a reasonable interpretation. I 
I, want, I wanted to dovetail off of uh, a couple of uh, Jonathan's questions. So <coughs> I'm just trying to understand a job description, you know, and I've had employees work for me and I've had to apply for jobs. That tells me what I do when I get the job. Okay. A qualification for the job, right? Eligibility, okay, which some of you remove from the board, that's an eligibility criteria. And in fact, the bylaws have eligibility criteria in them. So I'd like to understand how the board saw fit to take a bylaw change and shove it into a job description. So we have governing policies along with our bylaws, and as part of those governing policies, it goes into lining out eligibility requirements, what is expected of a, a director, what is expected of the officers, it goes into um, CEO relationships, it goes into all of those things. And so that's all laid in with the uh, governing policies, which is actually a pretty large document at this point. but. Um, that, that was where that was um, put. And, and I understand where it was put. It is the only eligibility criteria that is in, not in the bylaws. It is the only. No, not for a director. We're not talking about committees or other things. That is the only eligibility criteria. Um, I served on that committee, sir. And, I know. And there is a number of sections with regards to the directors, to the committees, to the officers that are all part of our policy governance document. That's, and that is where though that is where that change is. I, I understand it which had nothing to do with bylaws. That you're missing my point, ma'am. Eligibility criteria. In fact, there is a subheading in the bylaws on eligibility. And when you take somebody's status and say that that which is an eligibility criteria, and then push that into the bylaws. That's what I'm trying to get to. I understand where you placed it. That's why I'm asking the question. And I think that the answer that you're really looking for, if you really want to have that discussion, would be with the attorney, and specifically the NAR attorneys that wrote the opinion on where those things should go. Because this wasn't something that the board or anybody said, hey, let's go put this thing here. It was a question of, this is something that we are looking at. What is the proper place to put this? And the direction from attorneys and NAR attorneys, which of course were blessed, uh, or this is where this should go. So that, that is the answer that you're looking for. Okay, so there were discussions with NAR attorneys in the two weeks time when the removal happened and the bylaws change was suggested and then voted upon in August. No, this is prior to. It, interesting, okay. So the second thing I want to follow up on is the lockbox, the reciprocity with Wilco. Okay. Hmm. Is this well, a different I, question than yeah. everybody else is here? No, it's, it's, a, it's a follow up to it. Okay. okay. What I heard was that the differences between ABOR and Wilco is that Wilco you own them and ABOR you don't. Did that, meaning a member owns the lockbox? Okay. Do we own our lockboxes in ABOR? We own them. Yes. As individual members? No. no. Okay, yes. We don't own them. In Wilco, you own them. Is that correct, Jeff? Okay. So it seems to me that there's a business decision being made for ABOR's MLS benefit with Supra and not a decision that's being made to the benefit of the membership. I appreciate your feedback. We'll get a clarification on the lockbox thing, but I just want to be very clear that every single person here, in the, I believe within all of the committees, are always operating within the best interests of the members. Okay, who in the back of the room is standing in one to speak? Two people, not you. We're only taking two more. You blew it if you wanted to talk. <laughs> so who is there first? Yes, ma'am. Come on, now. You can't get one. I know if that's where you're going. You cannot get one. <laughs> you get one, but I don't know what you're I'm Agent Austin. I have one question, and it should be quick. Could you clarify what the ruling was in the hearing yesterday? 
I've seen a link to the article in the American Statesman. But could you clarify for this group exactly what the ruling was handed down? Thank you. And I may need the attorney on this one, but what I believe the ruling was. Let him do it. Okay, if you want him to do it, let him do it. Oh, he's going to do it. You guys are seeking clarity in your own little lawyer talk, wasn't it? <laughs> um, as I understood the judge's ruling, she temporarily enjoined us from having an election that did not include a, an election for seven people. And so. To go forward with the election, we need to have uh, seven positions available. So people will vote for seven of the candidates rather than five. Okay. Jack, do it. Would you please say your name and whether you're asking a question or a comment? <laughs> Good afternoon. My name is Jack Stapleton, and I have a couple there's no question, I'll keep it short. First, I want to thank everyone in this room for all the service that you give. I know that you're all volunteers. You put a lot of blood, sweat, and tears into your locals, and I, I thank you for, for that. Um, I'm here to speak mostly about lock losses today. Um, as you know, I'm the incoming president for the Central Texas Regional MLS. Um, the lock box scenario, each individual association owns their own lock boxes. Williamson County just recently purchased lock boxes. We did ask the Austin Board for a reciprocal lockbox agreement. We sent them a letter signed by our president, and we received one back signed by their president and staff saying that at this time that they're not willing to enter into a reciprocity agreement with Williamson County. I think that it is a, a failure, actually, because Williamson County members already are, most of them belong to actress, most of them already have a super account with them. So our members now have access to our lock boxes and we have access to their lock boxes. So we can get into all of them. But the Austin board members can't get into our lock boxes. So it's not an, an advantage that we're asking for. It's that we want to have a, a, a level playing field and we are reaching out to them saying, we want to do your members a favor. We want them to have access to our lock boxes. We're not, asking, we're not offering to have some sort of fees associated with this. It's we would like to have you guys have free access to our lock boxes. Would you like that? And they said no. So I guess if this was a question, it would be, why in the world would you say no? And, and, and just to be clear, um, the response, since that letter did go out in my name, um, the response was not at this time, because that, as I've already stated, we're evaluating. But thank you so much for your feedback. OK, I will ask some questions that have come in online. No, don't just out. For those of you that knew that questions were written back there, they were already asked, they had to do with the mergers questions. Here's two others. Um, I guess they're yours. What is the association doing to unite us as members? I think that um, there's, there's a long road ahead, and I believe that this is likely a very good start. I um, want you to know that each of us here are committed uh, and available to each and every single one of our members, and we do care, and we do um, want to uphold and protect uh, the organization as a whole and the members um, that it serves. And um, it's very important to continue uh, for us to be the ambassadors of those associations and be looking out for more of us. Uh, hopefully we'll be able to instill more two-way communication, and I'm looking forward to that. I know Steve has um, talked about implementing this more on a regular basis where we have the opportunity as a board to be out in front of our membership and to, to have that open uh, two-way communication and have the ability to answer and address all of your questions. Um, you can always reach any of us as realtors. Our information is all over online if it's not already on a website somewhere. So. Um, I think that's part of it, and I think that um, we, we're dedicated. We're dedicated to being unified and um, you know, making sure that there's some positive change that comes from this. This has been a really good opportunity uh, to hear from you and to learn more from you and to take action and actionable items and implement those steps, those things that you're all wanting. And, that, and that's really what we're trying to do, so thank you all. Can you ever a question? 
What is the association doing to unite us as members? I, mean, I heard one thing about it. Okay, and I'll just remind you that if you change two letters, it becomes untie us. But it's <laughs> so, so I think you know part of it too. You know, obviously the uh, the board you know takes direction from the uh, you know from the membership. But it's easy enough when stuff you know when things are going bad to just complain on Facebook and just gripe, right? It's what comes after. It's not just the board doing you know getting involved and making positive change. It's the membership as a whole. It's pretty disheartening when you have an event and you have the same two hundred people that show up at every single event. You know, hopefully, I'm in agreement with Kevin. I think, you know, there's a lot of positive that's going to come out of this, right? People, this is now, people are aware. Before, who had ever read the bylaws before? Nobody, right? Not everybody is an expert, right? <laughs> Not everybody is an expert in the bylaws, right? So hopefully, this has shed some light on everything that's been going on. And, you know, you can, this further increases the participation of everybody in the association because this is everybody's association this is not the board of directors association this is not the office association this is everybody's association so hopefully this you know this excitement this fervor continues on you volunteer for committees because how do you affect change if you're not present right so hopefully a lot of good comes out of this hopefully we move past um, you know, past all the hurt feelings and all the ill will, and start looking, you know, to tomorrow. So, in response to that question, it's not just what is the association going to do, but what are you going to do to help further this? Amen. So, reminiscent of 1960, I'm going to say one last thing. I've seen, I've seen some uh, some emails between. Uh, Facebook posts between petitioners and nominees, and I want to say, first of all, I commend every single one of the nominees and the petitioners for saying that they are going to run in the campaign and this is going to be, you know, a positive <coughs> campaign. Uh, and to the extent that they cannot, any nominee or any petitioner can control the people that are supporting them, um, I would also like to just personally, personally thank Jonathan Boatwright for a comment that I saw that he posted yesterday when. Somebody that Jonathan has no control over had said some pretty egregious things about another nominee, uh, and and he personally reached out and said this is not acceptable, and 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 seeing that he was going to take the next step to make sure that, that those kind of comments are not out there. We're all realtors, we're all members, we're all working to do the, the right thing. Um, and again, I just want to say thank you, Jonathan, for I mean for just taking it a step further. And I would encourage all of the people, petitioners, nominees any members to understand that we're all volunteer members and that the, 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 the negative you know, comments, whether it be towards nominees or board members or other petitioners, there's, there's just not a place for it in our professional association. So. Would the board consider posting archived minutes for member access on the Oracle? I believe that they are on there already, and if not, they should be in the movie, but I do believe they're already on there. You the, the, current year's minutes are posted, but we're working to archive for the year's back. Okay, so do you hear that? The current 2017 right. is already there, right. and you're working on going in, back in history. So if somebody that you and me, Gary, who have read the bylaws, can go back and read all the old minutes when we can't sleep at night. Um, somebody said that they thought all this conflict was good, and I agree with that. Brandy and I had a conversation before this began, and she was talking about how this has given her an opportunity to connect with people that she might not have ever connected with at another time, and how glad and grateful she was to have the opportunity to learn and grow. Sometimes she probably uh, was drinking wine, but just then she was not when she said that. Um, I think that's true. And I will also tell those of you who are candidates and those of you who are currently serving on the board, you will never please all the people. In 2016, when the commission voted to lower some of the fees, we had people who objected to that. <laughs> so no matter what you do, somebody's not going to like it. That's just the way it is. We honor the differences, we work through the differences, and I think that's what you guys, I honor you for doing this, all of you, for showing up today, for being kind, for being calm, for not using George Carlin's seven deadly words, 
for not shouting and for just being here and saying what you need to say in the nicest way. And everybody seemed to have kind of gotten along. We kind of like it. And just going to remind you, as you guys finish struggling with Mr. Rep, how the election process is going to go, that you are reminded to show up at the annual meeting at Realty Roundup on October the 18th, where Lawrence Yoon, who's the chief economist for the National Association of Realtors, will be your speaker and have all kinds of fun with networking, education, you might win a Mercedes, and tons of door prizes. And I'll remind you, for those of you who don't know Dan Kennedy or who else who's out there selling foundation tickets, you could win that Mercedes. I'm counting on doing that, but, but it could be you. It might not be me. Yeah. Oh, you have some more back there. Okay. So we thank everybody for your time. We know lots of places you should be today showing property, but you're here, and we appreciate it. Thank you all.